thank you all for coming. I would like to talk about Scala. What a surprise. Um, so first off, let me ask you some questions. Who here is completely new to Scala? Beginner, yeah, yeah. Um, who has seen some Scala, played a bit with it, but you know, that's all about it. There, 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 okay. Who is a hardcore Scala user? Yeah, okay, good, great. And who is planning after this conference to start working with Scala? <laughs> or continue? Continue. continue, yes, start. Everyone, everyone, come on. Yes, thank you, that's what I want to get at, great. Um, I would like to talk about Scala starting with a quick introduction, you know, uh, to very quick, because you mostly know what it is, but very quickly. Um, what are my f favorite features, etc. Then um, learning Scala, what does that mean? What did that mean to me? What could it mean for you? Um, and, and the next thing is, uh, what does it feel like using Scala on a day-to-day -day basis for six years? Actually, next month is going to be seven years. Uh, and, and, and in the end, the most interesting part is probably learnings, reflections, observations that I've collected or tried to collect over these years. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them at any time. I'm sorry, I don't have a book anymore, I should have brought two. Um, my name is Manuel Bernard, you may know me from another talk called Reactive Web Applications. That's only if you know The Simpsons, right? Otherwise this joke doesn't work, so I guess not many people here are watching The Simpsons on a regular basis, it doesn't matter. So you've seen this before this morning, I'm a scuba diver, I help companies start with reactive systems, I'm training them for this as well, and find out more on my website. I wrote a book called Reactive Web Applications that talks about reactive web applications. What a surprise with Play, Scala, Reactive Streams and Akka. Um, okay, so let's start with the introduction. You know, what is Scala? Where does it come from? Where will it go? So, um, oh yeah, all the scuba diving pictures I took myself. This is Scala, a Scala pin at 20 meters depth in Egypt somewhere. There's an anchor um, and uh, it's still there, I guess. The Scala language was, the first release of the language was in 2003, was written, designed and all of that by Martin Odersky from the Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne in Switzerland. Uh, it's got now over half a million active users, which is great. And the greatest thing is not that it's got all these users, it's just that this keeps on rising, okay? So it's not, a, it's not a fad and it's going down, no, it's actually continuing to increase. The curve continues to increase, which is great. Um, and um, my favorite features, and I've changed my mind about this, you will see in a minute. The first one is a case class. This is not a case class, this is a Java Pojo, um, which has two fields up there, or three fields, name, surname, age, then we have a constructor, we have the getters, uh, hash code and equals, and this is immutable. Now the same thing in Scala you do with this line here, it's called a case class, it generates the, it has the constructor, it has all the getters, it has equals, it has hash code, you use it like this, you create a new Bob, um, either using positional parameters or using named parameters, it's the second one here, which is great when you have many of them, and then it's immutable, so if you want to change something, you create a copy. The compiler generates a copy method for you. So there you go, you have John, and you just copied Bob. Um, that's, that's, a, that's really, this is really showing um, the uh, terseness that's proper to Scala and was designed into the language is to be a terse language where you use simple things to express a lot. As said, it has hash code equals, etc., for free. Uh, it's serializable by default, which makes it a nice thing uh, when you do things like encoding JSON, XML, what's or not, passing data around. It's called the value object pattern. Right. Um, I used to put this in here, type inference as being one of my preferred things, you know, the, the compiler. But I realized, no, that's not, I could do without. What I couldn't do without is immutability. So there is a paper from Pat Helen called Immutability Changes Everything. If you haven't read it, go and read this paper. It's great. It shows you know, how, in general, IT systems have evolved over time. And we, keep, we store everything. We keep everything because we now have the space. We don't need to mutate in place. And this makes working with distributed systems much more easier. And in Scala, things are 
you know, immutable by default. You have a val here. You cannot override the val. Uh, the list, the data structures by default of the collection library are all uh, immutable. And all of that makes it simpler to make less errors because you don't mutate global states somewhere up there and don't know what the state is anymore. And especially in a multi-threaded environment, it's really important. So that's you know, my second most favorite thing. And then the third one, of course, are functions, higher order functions. So here I have an example. That's a function. I have an is major function that takes a user and checks whether the user's age is greater than 18. It's called is major. Very simple. It returns a Boolean. Now let's imagine that I have a user group. And that group has a filter method or function that takes a predicate, which is a function itself from user to Boolean. So this is a function that takes another function as an argument. It's called an higher order function. That's it. It's a scary name, but it's not so scary what it is. It may also return a function that's also a higher order function. Um, so now that I have this higher order function, what I can do in Scala, I can just pass in my is major function reference. <coughs> so I don't need to to uh, expand this and pass any arguments to it. The compiler knows is major, is, it has the right type, it, it goes from user to Boolean, I can use it. And so in Scala, functions are first class citizens of the languages, they are objects that you can pass around. You can compose them, it's the foundation of functional programming and it's what is making Scala and JVM so attractive. And the functional programming principles, object orientation in the same language, extremely powerful. Um, and definitely one of my favorite features. Right, learning Scala. What does it mean to learn Scala? So here I'm trying to just say what, you know, what in general it means because one of the criticisms of the language is that um, it's hard to learn. People are like, oh, Scala, but it's so hard because they see all these blog posts with type level things and macros and it's more on that later. But um, this is Shaddai Ladad. He learned Scala when he was 11 years old. Okay, and he's a smart kid, that's for sure. He's talking about Scala days in Oscon since 2012 about this games he was implementing. But he's, he was 11, that means that at some level Scala is simple enough to learn. If a kid can learn it, then you know, computer science engineers should know how to learn this language. Another example of Scala being actually easy to learn there was a uh, Coursera course, you know, these are uh, MOOC course, it's called, it stands for Massive Open Online Courses. These are free courses, completely free, you can attend, you should be attending for five weeks or so in a row, do the exercise every day. This course, the first Scala course, had a completion rate of 10% with over 400,000 participants. It's the highest, uh, it's the highest score in the industry for that. Um, and now, it means that at some level people got hooked on the course and it was easy enough to follow and they followed through. And Lund, uh, the University of Technology, the, the Scala is the starting beginner language, programming language. So it's a beginner language. So it's, it's easy, right? It's something that can be learned. How did I learn Scala? I started in 2010, I started dabbling with it, playing, reading a book. I tried reading the big book from Odersky and Vanners, and then I kind of flunked out at the middle because it was too long, and I uh, read a shorter one. Um, but I was just, you know, testing around, using it in tests, in Java projects, but in the tests. Um, in 2011, I discovered functional programming using JavaScript. So you can say what you want about JavaScript, and I'm going to be the first person to not say so many nice things about JavaScript or the JavaScript environment. But it's a functional programming language. It, it's got first-class functions. A, you know, the, func the, the syntax is a bit odd. You have a function you have to write out. But you can pass functions around and behavior around, which is the foundation and the basis of functional programming. So that's how we got there. Um, then in my second startup, we used the Play Framework with the first generation Play Framework with the Scala module. And then in 2012, we had too many beers and we decided to port it to Play 2.0.0. Never ever do that. If you ever want to migrate a big project, don't ever, 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 ever port it to a 0.0 .0 release. That's a very bad idea. I don't know what we were thinking. 
It was painful, lots of bugs, but at least we had the whole stack on Scala. It was great. Um, and then from 2013 on, I had several client projects doing Scala. And what I've been doing over the two or three past years is I've, I'm trying to teach Scala, help teams getting up to speed with it. The book I wrote, the examples are in Scala, so that also forces you to think about how you write code. Because once it's in print, you know, and the code doesn't look good, it's painful. Um, and I'm giving trainings, uh, Fast Track to Scala being one of them. Um, key moments in learning, so this is important here. Uh, I think the hardest thing when you, when you have um, an imperative Java object-oriented background um, is to do the transition towards expression-oriented programming. Expression-oriented programming meaning that you have only immutable state and you have small expressions that mutate that state. That took me approximately, I would say, six months until my brain said, click. You said, what you have to do, you have to forget what you, what you used to know. You have to unlearn and learn again a new paradigm of programming. This is the hard part, I would say, when you want to do the jump from imperative to declarative programming. You don't say anymore how you want it to be done. You say what you want to have done. And uh, it's pretty powerful, but also takes some time to adjust, your, shift your mind, sort of. First thing, the second thing, and I'm still learning on this, is um, using types. And when I say types, I mean strong semantics, like not string or Boolean, but, uh, you know, actual types with, you know, user, car, whatever your domain model gives you, using these everywhere. It helps the compiler to catch your errors, but it also helps you to, um, to uh, write code that's easier to read for human beings. All right, so if you want to learn Scala, there is a quote by Brian Kernighan and Dennis Ritchie that says, the only way to learn a new programming language is by writing programs in it. I fully agree and subscribe to this. Uh, if you want to learn Scala, write some Scala. It's not enough to read some Scala. You also have to go and make the effort of actually writing it. If you want to learn it, <coughs> Um, there is a new Coursera courses offered by the Scala Center. Check out this scala.epfl.ch, that's the Scala Center. It's a pretty new organization that's geared towards, you know, community, uh, like Scala and the community, Scala community. And they're offering these new courses on Coursera for free. Also, go and visit your local Scala user group. There's one here. There are some in many cities, and if, there, if you live somewhere and there is no Scala user group, go and create it. On meetup.com, I think Lightband is even sponsoring the, the meetup.com fees, if I'm not mistaken, or they used to. I don't know if that's still the case. In any case, um, go and do hackathons, workshop, what's or not. There is no excuse there, really. Uh, so, that was about learning. Let's talk about using Scala. By the way, if there is any questions, don't hesitate to interrupt me. Even if you cannot win a book, you can still ask a question. It's okay. So, um, using Scala, how does it feel like doing that for you know so many years? Don't you get bored? Well, to be honest, I didn't only do Scala for six years in a row in front of a computer, but I've been using this as my main programming language, so to speak. So, the first nice thing, though, is this. And I hope you can read this. It says, it's an operating room, and it says, Doctor, have you ever heard of a null pointer exception? So that's what's happening when you're using a language that has its roots in Algol 60, where you have null references. Um, you get null references and null pointer exceptions. You may say that they're easy to fix. I know exactly which line I have to look at to find the cause. Yes, that's true. But if you get at the 3 a.m. and you have to fix that and redeploy in production, that's actually annoying as hell. So I, I have to say that in, and one of the design goals of Martin when he created Scala was to get rid of these. And in, in six years of using Scala in my own code, I've not even seen 10 NPEs. You just have to adhere to a few simple principles immutability, not initializing things with null or doing crazy, lazy initialization stuff. And then it works. The only times where I got these were from Java libraries that I was using that was throwing some null pointer exceptions in there. Um, but even that you can fix by 
wrapping the result in an option. You can always recover from this stuff. So this is solved and this is great because I don't know, I cannot quantify how much time it cost me former, previously. Uh, all this null pointer exception, but it sure interrupts the programming flow. Um, generally speaking, at runtime you have a lot less problems. This is the play framework and the nice thing about the play framework is that when it doesn't compile, uh, you get exactly where. And there is a trick, by the way, uh, to set up your IDE so that uh, you can click on this and, and it jumps directly in your IDE on the line and position of where the error is. It's pretty great for development flow. Um, the play framework, the idea is everything should be compiled and that's, of course, code, but also Scala templates, but also JavaScript code that you use being managed by the Play Framework with the Google Closure Compiler, um, URLs, what's or not. You can use Scala.js, all of this stuff to have the... I'm not saying that you will not have surprises at runtime, but you will have much, much less surprise at runtime. And when you do refactor, you have a high degree of confidence that your code will still be running after you've done the refactoring. Now, one more thing is that you write less code, okay? Case classes, um, but also things like stackable traits, which kind of allow something close to multiple inheritance. It's not exactly multiple inheritance, but it's close to it. It allows for code reuse. You end up with less code. And even if you say, yeah, but my IDE could generate all these getters and setters and hash code for me, it's still code. And it's clutter, and it's stuff you have to maintain. And if you change the name of a field somewhere or something, it's still going to break if you're not careful. So um, less code, less stuff to maintain, higher maintainability. It's only a win, I would say. Um, OK, IDEs and editors. So I've used IntelliJ IDEA for the past seven years. And um, when I started with Scala, this was crashing every 10 minutes, and I wanted to throw my computer out of the window. It's, I don't know why it hap has not happened, but it was really frustrating. It would literally crash the whole computer. Really frustrating. I am happy to report that this is solved, and it's actually pretty fast now. And on modern hardware, it's really, really fast. There is, if you're an Eclipse user, there's the Scala ID for Eclipse. And if you're using, if you're a hardcore editor person, uh, you can also use something called the Enhanced Scala and Java Interaction Module for editors, for text editors, Enzyme. Um, and I, I put the S key here because if you're an Apple user and, and, and you watched what's going to happen, already happened with the new generation of MacBook Pros, they don't have the function bar anymore on top, which means the escape key is gone, the physical one, which if you're a VI user like I am, you're lost. So you can get this extension there. I'm kidding, you're not going to get this extension, but it's really painful. Um, yeah, so that's just a small rant. I'm sorry about that. Um, so, the Scala compiler, that's one thing that gets a lot of criticism as well because it's like, there is this joke, the first being that while Scala compiles, you can go and slack off and play games. The second one is if you're compiling a Scala program, you don't need a heating in the winter because huh, um, your laptop is going to heat the whole room for you. And yes, the Scala compiler is slower than the Java compiler. Big surprise, it's got, I don't know, 12, 13, 14 phases, I don't remember. Many, many more in any case uh, than Java because it does a lot more things. But at the same time, it gives you a high, much higher degree of confidence about the code. It will catch many more mistakes that the Java compiler cannot catch because simply the type system is not of the same level. It's not as sound. Um, but it's got so much better. When I upgraded to this machine, which is already, I think, two years old, a project that used to take 10 minutes to compile took one minute to compile on this. So modern hardware really solves this issue. Also now in the latest releases of SBT, there is incremental compilation uh, that makes things a lot, lot better. It takes a lot less time. Now, of course, if you're doing things like type level and generic programming, like using a library, like for example, Shapeless, which relies on the compiler doing a lot of compilatory things to solve the prob problem, it's going to be slow as hell. And, but then you're really asking for it. So that's 
you know, that's your choice. I'm not saying you cannot do it, I'm just saying it's your choice. Um, then it's going to be slow. But other than that, I, th I think it, you can be really productive these days. Uh, when it comes to jobs and developers, the demand has drastically in increased. I don't know what happened here in 2015, but then like suddenly, woo! And actually, I don't have a graph here, but if you compare it to other languages on the JVM, such as Clojure or, you know, uh, Jiton and all of that, all these other languages that you have on the JVM, uh, Scala is much, much, has a much higher adoption rate than, than the rest of them, also in terms of job demands and all of that. Um, and this is already outdated, but there was this blog post um, on Scala popularity. If you take Scala as one and you compare it, these are job offers. Java is only 18.1 times more popular. So it's still a niche language, but it's not 100 or 1,000 times less popular than Java. And that's one thing you often hear is like, ah, but it's like 1,000 times, you know, not many people. That's not true. It's only eight, one in 18, and that's actually not too bad. And this is like, this, this the gap is closing. I'm not going to say that Scala is going to rule the world anytime soon. It's going to stay with Java. But this is a niche language that's there to stay. That's my opinion and my firm belief. And, you know, in some domains, we saw Spark Talk just now, that you want a language like Scala to help you because otherwise you're just going to have a lot of pain. All right, um, what have I learned with regards to Scala over the past almost seven years? I think that's the most interesting part of this talk. I hope you will agree with me. Mm. The first one thing I want to talk about, a little diversion, is called the Dreyfus model of skill acquisition. So now there is this book called Pragmatic Thinking on Learning by Andy Hunt. Who knows this book? One, two. Oh my God. So get this book, really. Um, we work in a profession, in a field where things keep on changing constantly. If we want to stay on top of things, we have to continue learning every day. Um, and we cannot stop. We don't, if we, you know, especially if you work in JavaScript, if you look away for two hours, there's 20 new frameworks. So you have to find a way for you to learn fast. And this book is really, there is a lot of good advice in there as to how to learn fast. Um, I think that's one of the most important things that, that we have to be capable of doing in our industry and what we're doing. You know, the the Dreyfus model of skill acquisition works like that. You have a scale from novice to expert and you have different things here. And what, what the model basically says is you start as a novice um, you will adhere to rules, you will look at rules to get stuff done, okay? Um, but uh, as you get more proficient and you be become an expert, you will trust your intuition much more often. You will not look things up or look at how exactly is someone on Stack Overflow, even though it's really convenient to have Stack Overflow, but um, you will rely less on this and rely more on your intu intuition to get stuff done. Uh, when there is something going wrong, the novice will consider everything like, do I have the right Java version? Do I have the right Scala version? Is my IDE version the right? So very broad thing, no focus. The expert will have a good idea where the, the error is. It will be able to focus much, much faster on, on where the, the source of the error is. And when it comes to interacting with the environment, novice will be like, yeah, I'm an outside observer, I'm just observing, I'm, I'm doing it. The expert will think that they're like part of the game and they want to change and improve the environment. And this is for any kind of skill that I'm talking about. This is not related to Scala, but I'm, I'm using this, I'm showing this as an example when I'm talking about learning about the programming language because that's a rather big undertaking. Uh, so the, the dangerous thing is to be here, advanced beginner. You start to be able to do stuff and then you don't have feedback and you get stuck. And then there is another thing that kicks in or can kick in if you're unlucky. It's called the Dunning-Kruger effect, which is about overestimating your own abilities. So if you're in a bubble and you work, that's often happening if you work on your own or if you have a small team and you all start at this level, 
It's dangerous because you can, you can be under the impression that you know stuff, but in fact you don't really. And uh, I've seen that, uh, you know, often rants about not only Scala, but programming languages, tools, and so on. They happen in teams or in situations where someone isn't there, thinks they've understood it all, but really they got it wrong. And then they get frustrated because things don't work and they blame the tool or the language or whatever. Uh, because they overestimated what they knew. So that, and I, in my experience, it's really hard to sort of detect, have this sort of detect about yourself that you're in this situation. So, you know, being humble, that's one of the first things that should be taught in a, any computer science class or degree. I don't know if it is, but um, it's really important. Our brains are not that big. Our brains are small and computers are hard and complicated and strange. So um, I think that's also a, a thing to be aware of. Anyway, let's talk a bit uh, about what I want to say in terms of Scala here. So my first tip, my first advice, even if you're a seasoned Scala developer, rethink this kind of things, mm, spend a little time understanding the design of the Scala language. That will make it easier to learn Scala in the future. So what do I mean with this? In one of the first talks that I've seen about Scala that Martin Lodersky gave at EPFL that was recorded, really old thing, there was a Venn diagram at some point, you know. Scala is this thing, functional programming, object-oriented programming, we're in the sweet spot here. Great, awesome. Um, I think you've seen this or may have heard of this or agree with this. Well, I kind of disagree with this. I think there is more to it. What's more to it? We have macros, and then this strange thing called T, and that's a type or type annotation or type level programming. Now, why do I show this? Well, because what you need if you want to write a program is this stuff. What you hear about on Twitter and read in blogs is this stuff. Right? Right? I mean, come on. That's true, right? We only ever see this. Nobody talks about functional or object-oriented object -oriented programming. No, nobody talks about this. Um, and that gives the false impression that in order to do Scala, you need to be good at this stuff. I worked on a project, a guy who just started, developer started using Scala. Three weeks in the project, he wrote his first macro in the project. And I'm sorry to say, but that's code smell. That's not macros are, you know, they're supposed to be in libraries and things. If you, you don't, you shouldn't be creating macros in your application that's barely three weeks old. Maybe if you have a three, four year old application, then yes, I will concede that macros might be useful for your special case, but maybe not right at the beginning. Same thing with type level programming. That's great, that's a nice theory, but heck, if you just get started with the language, please, let's get the basics first. And what I mean to say, and why I'm ranting here, and I'm really ranting, is that often I get this, and people are afraid and scared of, of learning Scala or getting into Scala because they're under the impression that you need this stuff. And no, I don't agree. Forget about this stuff. Start with the basics. It's OK. And, um, and then if you want, someday, get into the hard stuff. But that's definitely not the most important thing. And I can understand that when you've been working with Scala for 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 years, yes, maybe then you're, you don't want this anymore. You want to do this stuff because that's more fun. But that doesn't mean that if you're getting started that all you want to do is being productive and pre creating software with Scala, that you need all of these things. Ha, okay, now that's, that's out, let me get to the next thing. Um, understanding the purpose of, and the, of the features of the language. So the one thing that, that, um, that Martin, again, used as a design choice is that the language as its core is a simple language, but it should be easy to expand it via libraries. So for example, all the collections in Scala, they're not part of the language. They're just part of, it's just a library that implemented, that's implemented on top of this. So there's a few features, implicits, implicit conversions, all of that, that uh, make this language extensible and make it look like some constructs are part of the language where they're not really. Now, when you get to start using Scala, what you have is you have this effect of, wow, all these features, 
great. Uh, let me use all of them at once. And again, that's, that's, you know, that's, not, that's not the idea. So if you are to remember only one thing about this talk is, and if you were starting with Scala, and you look at the Scala language level. It's like when you learn a real language, you have levels. Here's the same thing. You have three levels for application programmers, and then you have three levels for library designers. And all these, these levels, they list features that you should know at these different levels. And the reason is very simple. It's that the features that you need to build applications in Scala are not the same as the ones you need to build libraries. Let me repeat that. The features that you need to build applications are not the same as the ones you need to build libraries. Um, you don't need to know about macros and many of the higher, you know, more advanced features if you just want to write an application. You can just use the library and, you know, don't, don't worry too much about what's going on. Uh, now, there is an SIP. SIP stands for Scala Improvement Process that is about modularizing the language features. And if you want to use uh, an advanced feature, you need to import it. Otherwise, you get a compiler warning. This compiler warning in the future might very well be a compiler error. So it doesn't let you compile unless you explicitly say, here, I'm using this language feature to mark it, to make it uh, readable and available to other developers that you're doing something advanced. Um, and so that's one of the criticisms that Scala gets, especially from, J from the Java universe. It's like, ha, in Java, you have all these simple constructs when you can get junior programmers started really quickly because you don't have all this crazy voodoo stuff going on. That's called incidental complexity. But is incidental complexity really a problem that's specific to Scala? Or is it happening someplace else? Well, I would argue that it's also happening someplace else. For example, in Java. By the way, if you can't read it here, you have a private collection of employees. And then you have all of this stuff to make it work. And OK, that's a parody. It's like an annotationmania.com. And this is evolving every year. Uh, but, and that's the sad part, it's inspired from real code. Not, you know, it's not as crazy as this stuff, but um, it still exists. And that, this is how Java has evolved, basically, because language hasn't evolved for many years. So we have annotations. Let's use them. Let's generate runtime proxy factory beans. And then at 3 AM in the morning, when Nagios reports that the server is down, I have to debug this. And my, my, stack, my business logic is here. Good luck finding it at 3 a.m. in the morning. Um, this is what's happened. And this is, again, is a ramp. I have to say I prefer that I have to fight for two days with the compiler to compile code before I deploy things in production rather than having at runtime to figure out what the hell went wrong with the dynamically generated proxy thing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yeah, third thing, when, and that, that is of course not specific to Scala, but if you learn something new, like regular expressions, don't use regular expressions to solve all of your problems. <laughs> For example, in Scala, we have a thing called a for comprehension. So for example, here I have one user, two users. They're both an option, which means an option is a box. It may or may, may not contain a value. But I want to access these both things at the same time. So I use a for comprehension. It reads like for bob in bob user, carl in call user, yield bob.h plus carl.h. And that returns an option of int. If they're both there, great. I will have a sum int. And if not, I will have a none. But I have both of them. This is a great tool in Scala. You can use this to combine these, these boxes. Um, and then you have this. It's called a full comprehension from hell. And no, I didn't make this up. This is real code that runs in production. It's quite amazing that it runs. For, bam. There is even an if here. 
if else, oh my God, what's going on? Uh, and, and then yield, it yields this, and it's like, this is horrible. And this is what I mean, don't overuse a feature, don't make everything fit in these four comprehensions for the sake of using a four comprehension, pretty please don't. Um, yes. Fourth tip, it's not because you're using functional, uh, have a fancy functional programming um, uh, ready language that object oriented is the new evil and you should forget everything about it. That's something that's far too common. Let me show you what I mean. Here we have a class, it's called synchronization service. It's got a method called synchronization, synchronized golf. And it's got one, two, three, four higher order functions. So we have functions everywhere. Yes, great. Um, if I want to run this, I have the Cartesian product of four higher order functions that I can pass to it, not mentioning the other parameters. But it's like, it's like really, this is hard to understand what this is doing, and it's hard to understand what uh, you should be passing to it. Has anyone got an idea of what this could be replaced with? Or which, no, let's put it like this, which basic fundamental principle of object-oriented programming could be used to make this code more readable? <laughs> Sorry? Object? Object? Interface. Interface? But the principle, like the, these higher level principles. Inheritance. inheritance, yes, inheritance, yes. So we have an abstract class, we have a few methods here, we have this thing here, and there it, you go, and it's actually readable, and you just implement a few variations of this object. Uh, that's about it, right? Not everything about object orientation is evil. Keep that in mind as you go and learn functional programming. Um, that's going to be helpful. So, tip number five. Uh, how much time is left, by the way? One hour? One hour? Yeah, great. I could go on, you know. Um, no, I think five minutes, something like this. Five minutes. Five minutes, okay. Transitioning to Scala when you're in a team. Is that something I've seen a few times in, the, in, in, in my in different client projects or, you know, on rants and people working with Scala and Teams. Um, my advice would be, don't start a Scala project if your team is comprised only of novice or advanced beginners. You remember the Dreyfus model we talked about previously, these two things. If you start and you only have people that are really fairly new to the language, it may become uh, messy, but I mean, that's not really Scala specific. That's something that happens with any technology out there. Only if you use that for a programming language, it might be a bit more problematic because it's the foundation of all the software you're writing. And then you get people pretty frustrated at their experience with using Scala because they took the wrong turns and then they end up with a code base full of wrong turns and that's painful to work with. Um, now, generally speaking, what happens is not so much about technology. So let me, let me read this. The biggest challenges of transitioning to Scala, or anything new, are rarely technical. Talented programmers can learn a new syntax, new concepts, and new IDE. Rather, change often brings out the weaknesses in other areas like process and culture. That was from Kevin Weber, who used to be working at Lightband. Um, and I completely agree and subscribe to this. If you want to learn a new technology, a new language, make sure that you are in an environment or that you, if you're a manager, talk to your bosses, managers, where you create this environment that's a learning environment um, where it's, it's allowed to fail. It's okay to you know, could do code reviews, ex talk to one another about what you've learned, but create this environment, otherwise it's, it's often painful and, and um, not really fun. Um, also, if you cannot get anyone who has some experience with the technology, with Scala, try to bring in, even if it means bringing in someone, like an external consultant, whatever, for once in two weeks, do a code review and show 
here you took a wrong turn, here you took a wrong turn, but make sure that since from the beginning you, you, may, you, you, you avoid all these frustrating things. Because that, yeah, that's basically what I'm saying. What I want to say here is uh, try to create the right conditions for adapting the language as a team. And that's it. Um, in conclusion, what I would like to say is use the force, I mean use the case class, um, embrace Scala's terseness, but don't forget about the language levels. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Over there, there is one question. So maybe I can just yell. Uh, so that, okay. Fast. <coughs> thanks. So uh, thanks. That was a wonderful talk. I don't have a question. I actually have more like a comment, which uh, um, I, I want to say in. in uh, I, I want it to be. Uh, <laughs> interpreted as a constructive comment of criticism. Like, it was really a great talk and uh, it seemed to me a little bit that you're preaching to the choir and uh, what I really think that you should do is take this talk and go to a Java conference and, and show them this. <laughs> yeah, you were right. I mean, I was, uh, this is what I tried to do as well. Um, and I was not sure, I was like, how is going to be the degree of people knowing, like newcomers, I hope they're the newcomers, the people that are starting with Scala or got something from it, or maybe, you know, I don't know. I hope you still got something from it. But yeah, definitely I'm, I'm doing that at Java conferences as well when they let me do this talk. You know, so. <laughs> uh, my question, uh, actually, uh, and no. Uh, so uh, you've mentioned that uh, one needs to have a safe environment to uh, learn Scala. So just uh, as an addition to that tip, uh, uh, I could uh, recommend two ways that uh, people uh, start with Scala in, in commercial projects, and uh, that is also my experience as well. So uh, one thing is to uh, use Scala in uh, quite separate components, like a mini library uh, that can expose uh, Java interfaces to, to Java code uh, still be implemented in Scala. So this greatly reduces risk even if your company doesn't have a big budget for experiments and creating safe environments. And the uh, other thing, uh, but uh, the other thing is kind of trap, uh, is uh, that you can uh, you write your unit test in Scala uh, for your uh, Java code base. But the trap is because uh, usually uh, the uh, test make more sense if the production code is also in Scala. So this works, but it doesn't bring that many benefits as one would expect. Uh, but uh, the vertical components mini libraries is a proven, thing, proven way of introducing, uh, at least in my case, I can recommend it. Yeah, thanks, yeah, that's, that's this small things, reducing risk, that's at the management perspective is the most important thing, you want to reduce risk when you introduce new, new technologies, you're completely out there with that, that's a great advice. Maybe add it to this talk then, thanks. More questions? Or if not, feel free to grab me later on or at the party. Yes, thank you. <laughs>